Happy weekend, everyone. I hope you've all had a wonderful week. Now, the episode I'm covering today, I decided to cover it, even though there is like no photographs. There's one of the victim, one of the victim's daughter and one of the perpetrators. So I'm really sorry on the limited photographs, but I can't do anything about that. There is no photographs out there. But because of the nature of this crime, it happened in 2009, but I know I've heard this sort of thing happen a lot more, and especially nowadays. And it was such a random attack that I know that it could happen to me or you the next time we go out, we could never come back again. So I I just think it's really important to share. And because I'm a true crime channel, it's good to have a variety of different types of crime because it shows that, you know, all these things happen to just anybody at any time. And I feel like it's really important to talk about. Now, I got all the information from a documentary and also there was a large amount of newspaper articles. In the newspaper articles, they say he's 36 years old. And in the documentary, they say he's 37. So I'm not really sure exactly how old. I'm going to say 36 because the last article I read had his daughter talking all the way through it and that said 36, but I don't know. So I'm just going to say 36 anyway. Like I said, I'm really sorry about the photographs, but I hope this story carries itself. So today we are covering the case of Christopher Folks. Christopher Folks was a 36-year-old man. He lived in Blackburn in Lancashire. He had two sisters and a brother. His sisters were called Lisa and Rachel and his brother was called Jason. His mother is called Christine and it's said that they had a really lovely upbringing. Now, as Chris got older, he met this lady and fell in love and they had a daughter together named Jamie Lee. Sadly, when Jamie Lee was just around two years old, the relationship between her parents broke down and they decided to split up. Now, Chris decided that he wanted custody of Jamie Lee and he tried his hardest to get custody of her, but it didn't work and Jamie Lee ended up moving in with her mum in Blackpool. This broke Chris's heart and it's actually said that even though his daughter did come and visit him on basically every school holiday, he was just really sad and he went downhill from there on. His sisters believe that this was the start of Chris's drug habit. Now this started with just sleeping pills, just to help him sleep. Now I guess this didn't last very long and he was looking for something stronger. Then when that wasn't strong enough, he went to something else. And then sadly, Chris ended up in regular use of heroin and it's said that he was a heroin user for a very long time as well. Like I said growing up Chris come from a really loving family and one of his passions when he was a child was horses. He loved horses. His mum and his sister would go to the stables and muck out the horses in the evenings. Chris would always go along as many times as he could in the week and help his mum and his sister. He really loved riding the horses or cleaning the horses. He just liked being around them. And his passion actually carried on right the way through his life and carried on with his daughter. Chris actually taught his daughter how to horse ride. Now, Jamie Lee recalls her dad being a complete, total, like, computer geek, and he would often download many movies off the internet, and they would sit and watch them at night when she would stay with him over the holidays. And he would also teach her how to play the PlayStation 2, which I think is so sweet. Now, Chris did manage to fight his dependency on the substances that he used. And this was with help from a program that he was involved in. So this program helped him come off heroin and... This was with the help of methadone. So Chris started to gain control of his life and things were really looking up for him. This was until the 30th of May 2009. Chris rang up his mum around 9pm and asked if he could come round and see her. 
he then said, could you come and pick me up? And she said that she really wanted to see him, but she'd been busy all day and it's believed that she had arthritis as well. So she said, just come round and I can't wait to see you. So he did. Like many other times before, he decided the fastest way to get to his mum's is by cutting through the local park, which is called Queen's Park. And this was around 9.30 at night. Now, bear in mind, this was the end of May, beginning of June. So the nights stay a lot lighter for longer. So walking through the park at that time of night is basically like walking through it during the day. As Chris made his way through the park, he came across a large group of boys, all sitting there drinking alcohol inside the park grounds. Now, Chris carried on walking because obviously a park is somewhere where teenagers go and hang out and he didn't really think anything of it. Chris then heard a boy shout. So he looked and then he realised the boy was shouting at him. So Chris shouts back, I don't know what you're talking about, bro. Then one of the boys said, I ain't your effing bro. Chris decides to carry on walking because it's said that the group of teenagers there was around or between 10 and 14 teenagers so you're not going to stand there and argue are you so Chris decides to carry on walking but the teenagers decided that they wasn't finished yet and a few of them not all of them I believe a few of them decide to chase Chris through the park one teenager in particular catches up to Chris He tried to punch Chris, but he misses. This is when he decides to kick Chris's legs from underneath him. So Chris then falls on the floor. He tried his hardest to defend himself, but the teenager was showing no mercy to Chris at all. And he started to attack Chris on the floor. There was people inside the park and they did shout at the boy to stop hurting him. Also, the boy's friends. They shout to him as well, stop, that's enough, you're going to get in trouble. But this boy does not listen at all. He doesn't care about what anyone else is saying. He just carries on attacking Chris. Chris then loses consciousness. So the boy grabs him by the feet and drags him to the lake, which is right there where he's attacking him. When Chris is just on the floor, this boy starts to attack him again. He only stops. Not because people are telling him to. He stops because he sees someone on the phone and I believe he heard him call for emergency services. And this is when the boy stops and run off. His friends also run off as well. Now, the witness that actually saw everything happen runs over to Chris and they are actually a nurse. So they stay with Chris until the ambulance come and try to make him as comfortable as possible and help him as much as they can. So the ambulance turn up with the police and Chris is taken to the Royal Blackburn Hospital. Chris is in a really, really bad way. When Chris arrives at the hospital, the doctors make him as comfortable as they possibly can and they run tests to see if he has any brain activity at all left. He is swollen and bruised and just really badly attacked. Christopher's family were then all informed that he had been viciously attacked and he was in hospital on life support machine. The doctors then broke the news to the family when they arrived at the hospital that Chris may not survive this. And if he does, if his heart doesn't go, and if he does survive, he will absolutely have no quality of life. On the 31st of May 2009, just the next day after the attack, doctors did everything they possibly could, but sadly, nothing more could be done to help Chris. His family were all around his bedside, and the doctors decided it was now time to switch off Chris's life support machine. The family sat around the bed and held Chris's hand. The machine was turned off. And 25 minutes later, Chris sadly passed away. Now the police were then heading to Blackpool to break the news to Jamie Lee, Chris's daughter. 
Jamie Lee said that she felt like she'd been kicked in the stomach when she was told. She was sitting there with her mum beside her. And as the police officer continued to talk and explain what had happened to her dad, she looked at her mum and she could see the sadness that she felt herself through her mum's eyes. And then she just couldn't look at her anymore. A murder investigation was then launched. An autopsy showed that Chris had died from head injuries. He had fractured bones throughout his face, which caused a swelling on his brain, which then caused his death. He had a fractured eye sockets and a broken jaw. With the murder investigation well underway, police searched through all of the CCTV footage that was actually located outside the park, all around the outside of the park. So this would have shown people coming in the park or leaving the park. Forensics were also working really hard to gather every piece of forensic evidence that they could because they didn't want any to get contaminated. Police then held a press conference asking for any witnesses to come forward, no matter how small they think their information is. There was three vital witnesses that actually came forward that was inside the park and saw the incident taking place. Also, a PCSO officer said that they had actually spoken to a group of teenagers inside the park and they knew their names. Now, with all of the witnesses and the PCSO, this gave the police a picture of who these boys was, what they were wearing. They had names of the people that was inside the park and the information found that one of the teenagers in particular was the one that actually inflicted this brutal attack on Chris. The police then makes three arrests to three teenagers. One of the teenagers is a 16-year-old boy called Mossin Muhammad. I'm, I'm not sure if I said that right. So Mossin Muhammad was 16 years old and two of his friends was also arrested. The police then questioned the boys and they refused to absolutely say nothing. They didn't want to speak. They didn't say that they were in the park. They didn't say they knew anything about it. They just didn't say anything. They didn't show any remorse. They they just didn't answer any questions. Now, the police had so much information that they knew that they were talking to the right boys. So they decided to search Muhammad's home, the 16-year-old. But they were looking for, obviously, his clothes, which these witnesses said that he was wearing. But they found nothing. They didn't find, find any clothes. It wasn't long after the interviews from all of the witnesses that one boy in particular was the one which caused Chris's death. And on the 3rd of June, 16-year-old Mohsin Muhammad, I know I'm not saying his first name right, was charged with murder. The two other friends that was arrested with him was released with no further charge. Muhammad never showed any mercy to Chris whatsoever, and nor did he show Chris's family any mercy either. He pleaded not guilty, and the case then went to trial. So on December the 5th, 2009, at Preston Crown Court, Chris's family were all in court facing his killer. Now, he didn't show any remorse. In fact, he was actually sitting there in front of his mates that were all inside the court with a large, smug smile on his face. The jury heard how a large group of teenagers hung out inside the park that day and a PCSO officer, which is a police community support officer, had spoken to these group of teenagers earlier that evening and he knew what their names was, and he was basically just keeping an eye on these teens. Now, at 9.30, Chris decided to walk through the park to go to his mum's. When the group of boys started to show her Chris, he shouts back that he doesn't even know what they're talking about, bro, and then they reply with, I'm not your effing bro. So he carries on walking to his mum's, and a few of the boys start to chase Chris. One of the boys that catch up with him is Muhammad. He then tries to punch Chris and didn't connect his punch with Chris. 
So he sweeps Chris's legs from completely under him and drops him to the floor. Mohammed then repeatedly kicks Christopher in the head and in the face until Christopher passes out. At this point, there are witnesses shouting at him and also his friends are shouting at him to stop. But Mohammed just doesn't care. He doesn't listen to anybody at all and he continues to attack Chris on the floor. He then drags his body down to the lake where he decides to stomp really hard up and down on Chris's head. He stomped so hard on Chris's head that witnesses explained that Chris's head and body bounced off the ground and fell back down again. Like I said, the only thing that actually made Muhammad stop and run away along with his mates is seeing someone call emergency services. The court then heard how Muhammad had thrown his clothes away thinking that they were never going to be found. And to be fair, the police actually didn't find him when they conducted a search on his home. It was later found that Muhammad was actually spotted disposing of a carrier bag in the local mosque. So the mosque had charity bins outside the mosque. And these large bins were for people who didn't want their clothes. They would just donate them into these bins. Now, after the police had gone around the community and actually spoken to people, they said that they saw Muhammad doing this and donating the clothes. This is when the police got in touch with the mosque and it said that they actually made some kind of deal so they could actually go in the bins, but I don't know why you would have to make a deal to go in the bins if they thought evidence was in there. Anyway, they located the van because when they went inside the bins, the bins were empty, they'd been collected. So the police then had to locate the van that collected the bins and they tracked that van down in Manchester. The police then had to search through 600 bin bags or rubbish bags full of clothes. Now the bag they were actually looking for was a Morrison's shopping bag. This was a plastic bag and it was actually located at the back of the van. Inside this bag was a blue jumper a blue jumper that actually had a sports logo on, a pair of bloodstained jeans and a pair of Adidas trainers. Now, this was a description, a full description of what the boys were wearing on the night of the attack. So obviously they were seen dropping this bag in there and then the bloodstains on the clothes. So the police then sent the clothes off for forensic testing and it actually came back that the blood found on the jeans was Chris's blood. It was a perfect match for Chris's blood. It also said that whoever owned these jeans basically was the person who inflicted the attack on Chris because the blood spatter all up the leg and around the hem of the jeans indicated that the person who actually committed the crime would be the person who wore these jeans Because of the splatter that sprayed all up the leg, a force of the person's leg who was in the jeans would have went in wet blood and came out and went back in wet blood with a force. So this would have created the splatter. Therefore, the person wearing the jeans was the one who committed the crime. Also, Chris's saliva was also found on the clothes that was found in the carrier bag as well. Not only did Chris's family had to sit and listen to what Chris went through, they also had to sit and deal with a large group of Mohammed's friends. And I mean large. They filled the courtroom. They were really disrespectful to Chris's family. And it's even said that they spat on the floor and spat next to Chris's family. They didn't care or show any respect at all. They were there solely for Mohammed. Now, Muhammad was playing up to them and that's why he was sitting there the whole time with a smirk on his face because he was on show to his mates. The witnesses that attended the trial had taken the stand and explained in gruesome detail what they saw the night of the attack. They described Muhammad in full detail and said that he had chased the victim through the park and then he was the person who tripped him up and attacked 
Chris in such a vicious and violent way by stomping and kicking him. The court also heard that Mohammed had sent a text message to his ex-girlfriend telling her that he had been in a one-to-one fight that night and he had killed someone unintentionally. After a week-long trial, the jury went out and they were gone for around about an hour and then they came back with a unanimous vote. They found that Mohammed was guilty of murder. Judge Butterfield said that this was a vicious and brutal sustained assault on a helpless and defenceless man who you quite literally kicked to death. It is wholly unbelievable that the victim brought the attack on himself. Not only are you guilty of assault, but you're a coward. Not only in the way of the attack on Christopher, but the way that you went about it and you tried to blame others. You did not have the courage to admit it, but attempted to lie your way out of it. I'm not particularly impressed by any suggestions that you have any remorse. Now, Mohammed was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 11 years because he is so young. When Mohammed was actually sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 11 years, Cheers came from the public gallery, which was members of Christopher's family. They were so happy that he got life imprisonment. Muhammad was no longer sitting in front of his mates with a smug smile on his face. Christopher's mother, Christine, said that Chris was not a fighter. He was a mild-mannered boy and he was not violent. We are all left devastated. Chris's sister Rachel said that she's pleased with the result and she feel like there is justice done today when she was at the trial, obviously. But she did say that Muhammad during the trial tried to say that Chris was racist towards him and therefore he attacked him. But this is not proven and Chris was not racist in any way. It's just Muhammad was trying to find a reason or an excuse that he attacked Chris, but basically he just kicked an innocent man to death. It is said around 15 minutes before Chris was actually attacked, another man had came across Muhammad and because he actually had dogs with him, Muhammad tried to approach him, but because the dogs sort of stepped up beside the man, Muhammad backed off and left. So I think he was basically looking for a fight that night. A couple of years after the court case happened, Jamie Lee gave birth to a son who she named Christopher after her dad. In 2015, Jamie Lee was given the chance to come face to face with her dad's killer. Now, this is a program called Restorative Justice Program where this gives families the opportunity to have, I guess, some kind of closure or ask questions to the person who actually committed the crime. Jamie Lee attended along with a few of her dad's belongings and she sat and waited for Muhammad to enter the room. She said that she sort of sat there for a minute and then she decided that she didn't want to do it. She was thinking, why am I here? And she got up to leave. This is when Muhammad walked through the door. Jamie Lee said he then burst into tears, which made her really angry. And she was like, why the are you crying for? Now, she did speak to him for around two hours, but all of the questions she asked, he did not answer all of the questions. He answered a few and left a lot of questions out. She did say that why haven't you ever said sorry for what you have done? Are you even sorry? And he said, of course, I'm sorry. And she said, but you've never said it. And he said, well, I wanted it to mean something. That's why I didn't say it, which I think is a load of bullshit. She also said, why did you do it? Why did you kill my dad? And basically, Muhammad just turned to her and said that he was showing off in front of his mates. That's why he murdered her dad. So her dad died 
because this little boy wanted to be the big man and show off in front of his mates. Now, she did it purely to give herself closure because she just couldn't move on with her life and she felt such guilt and she just needed to ask him some questions and she got that opportunity, so she took it. Then in 2016, it came to light that Muhammad had appealed his sentence and he won. Basically, 13 months was taken off his sentence. And then in 2020, parole was coming up. So Muhammad applied for parole for the first time. And it's normally said that the first time they apply is they're turned down. But Muhammad applied for parole and was granted. And after serving just under 10 years, he walked out of prison a free man. Christopher hasn't got that chance to come back to his family or to meet his grandson for the very first time. He doesn't get to live the rest of his life out. But Muhammad, he does. He gets to start his life all over again. He's basically still in his 20s, so he's got the rest of his life ahead of him, unlike Christopher. Thank you everyone for listening to today's episode. My voice is a bit dodgy today because I've got a chest infection, so I just want to say sorry for that. Also, I have a couple of questions. Would you, if you had the opportunity to meet the perpetrator that caused this kind of pain to your family, Would you meet them and would you ask them questions? And also, do you think it's right that Muhammad has been granted his parole and is now a free man and he's only like 20, late 20s? Do you think that's right when Chris has no life? He's he's dead. You know, he's never going to meet his grandson or anything. But Muhammad can go on to have children of his own. Do you think that's right or do you think he served enough time because he was young when he committed the crime? Just thought I'd ask them questions. (laughs) Anyway, thank you all so much and I'll see you all again soon. Much love, everyone. Take care.